morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you for your service as jurors on behalf of Telly Hankton. When we are picking a jury, one of the things that was asked of you all in particular, but also the entire venue, was could you sit and hold Telly Hankton with the presumption of innocence until the government proved to you beyond a reasonable doubt that he was guilty. Each of you individually said, I can do that and I promise to do that. I again want to say thank you on behalf of Telly Hankton, because in these three weeks, although we haven't had an opportunity to talk directly and we pass each other in the hall and don't acknowledge each other, we have paid attention to you and we know that you have paid attention to the evidence. This was not an easy case, trial to sit through. The evidence of murder, of drugs, of police corruption, it is a sad commentary on what goes on in the city of New Orleans. It is a sad commentary. In spite of that, I'm going to ask you to really revisit, not the broad brush, as we said when we started this trial. It must be Telly Hankton. That's what we said. But we are going to ask you to take your time and really think about what the government has put up against Telly Hankton. Not Kevin Jackson, not Andre Hankton, not Walter Porter. I'm standing up here to say please, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Quinlan just said there's overwhelming evidence that Telly Hankton is guilty of each and every count in the indictment. Let's talk about that evidence. Let's talk about it. Because as I was thinking about how do I bring it all together, how do I stand up here and convey to you what that evidence is? The first thing I thought about was, how did Telly Hankton get here? How did he get here? When I thought about that, even though the government says it's about valuable real estate on Josephine Street, it is about a big drug conspiracy. It is about him running an organization. That is how we got here. So let's talk about how we got here. He got here because Darnell Stewart. That's how this started. Darnell Stewart was killed on South Claiborne Avenue. When Darnell Stewart was killed, the New Orleans Police Department immediately said, Andre Hankton was stopped in his car and there was a second suspect that got away. It must have been Telly. That's how he got here. That's how it starts. It must have been Telly. So let's talk about the Darnell Stewart murder first. You heard William D. Paola get up on that witness stand and you heard him tell you, I was caught in the midst of gunfire. I'm driving home from work and the next thing you know, there's gunfire and I'm fearful. I'm scared. I think I'm going to be killed. And I pull up on the neutral ground to do what a good citizen would do, call and report it. You heard him tell you that I was crunched down in my car and I was looking over my shoulder as the gunfire and the person is hit with the car and flown in the air. You heard him tell you, I refuse to bear false witness against anybody. So he truly believes he identified the right man. He truly believes that. But you all have to pay attention to the details. We talk about how easy it is to misidentify. So when Di Paola testified, one thing he told you, Take off your coat, baby. One thing he told you was he saw the person in the passenger seat leaning out of the window with his right hand and his arm extended with the gun. I'm left-handed. Sorry, guys. I gave the wrong demonstration. It is the right hand with his arm extended. Please show them. That's the arm he says he saw. But when asked, did you see any distinguishing marks on that arm? His answer was no. You could see it from over there. Danielle Hampton told you she met him 20 years ago, and he had it. He didn't just get it. He had it. I'm sure he is thankful. Many people have criticized, but that may be his saving grace because that arm that Mr. DiPaola says he saw very clearly, he did not see any distinguishing marks. He was specifically asked. One other thing about DiPaola, he was shown a lineup. There was a lot of talk about this lineup because when someone sees a stranger, they give identification. They say, okay, he is about 5'10", he is 200 pounds, he is wearing, Di Paola says short sleeve shirt, he is wearing jeans. Then the police say, well, do you think we think this could possibly be? That very general description became Telly Hankton. So the police immediately, before interviewing Mr. Di Paola or John Matthews, sent someone, because a police officer said to Officer Orlando, who you did not hear from. Orlando Matthews, you heard his name, but you did not hear from him. He is the one who came up with the name Telly Hankton. When he came up with that name, they put together this lineup. Very interesting. One of the very distinguishing characteristics was a very thick beard. That was the words that we used. When I looked at that lineup, I say, well, 
How many people of the six could possibly be? We can automatically eliminate four of them automatically. The two left are not really that similar, but at least they have got beards. So Mr. DePaola says, that's him, that's him. And he has stuck to that because he has seen Telly Hankton consistently since that, since pointing him out. He has seen him on the news. He has seen him in court. He has seen that face over and over and over and over. He is certain. He told you that. He was certain. Let's talk about John Matthews, who also saw the person who shot Darnell Stewart. He gives a different description. Not a short sleeve shirt. He says a sweatshirt, long sleeves. He gives a different description. He says the person that I saw, I saw from the side, and it could be this guy, but I'm not certain. And he said that night he gave that, or the very next morning he gave the identification. He said that for a couple of years. And then he says, he finally decided to quantify it more recently. 95% sure, 98% sure. But the night when he said, when he gave that ID, you heard it out of his mouth and you heard it out of the police officers who testified. Similar, but I'm not certain. You heard me try to ask, and I think I got cut off, about this idea of misidentification. We have all done it. We have all done it. The most recent example I could point to is when the judge did it. When the parole officer walked into this courtroom with a black shirt and a logo and testified, and then another parole officer walked in this courtroom with a black shirt and a logo, the judge inadvertently said, Hey, you've already sworn. We all laugh when we realize it's a different guy. It happens. People misidentify people. It happens. So when we are talking about whether or not we can prove this man guilty beyond a reasonable doubt on the identification of two people who give different versions of what he was wearing in the hail of gunfire in a matter of seconds, you saw the video, we would hope. We would hope that overwhelming evidence that this government says they have against Mr. Hankton will give you a little more. So they say, well, we have a fingerprint. We have his fingerprint on the outside of his cousin's car. That's what we got. But you heard the officer, the forensic expert, who told you, we collected nine partially latent prints. Of those nine, we could probably really compare two fingers. Of those two fingers, they were on the outside of a vehicle that he was supposedly inside of. And I can't tell you when they got there. That's what the evidence showed you. I can't tell you when they got there. And yet the government says overwhelming evidence. He did it. Then we started out with saying, well, where does it go from here? Darnell Stewart. The government today says this is about valuable real estate on Josephine Street. But initially, when this case first started, when Telly Hankton was initially arrested, it was about the murder of his cousin. It was about Jesse Reed and Darnell Stewart killing George Cup Hankton in 2007. That's supposedly what this case was about. When Jesse Reed was identified as the murderer of George Cup Hankton, he was in jail. You heard the officer tell you. She put out an arrest warrant for him when he was in jail for four counts of attempted murder. You heard other people say that Darnell Stewart died before he could be arrested and he had killed other people. But again, if we try to put the pieces together in this really ugly puzzle, why not say Telly Hankton went after him? Nobody else, just gotta be Telly. But I'm asking you, ladies and gentlemen, to make sure when you sit down and think about the evidence, not from emotion, not from empathy for all the victims, the evidence, you will find that there is no evidence that places Telly Hankton at the scene of the Darnell Stewart murder. There's no evidence. Let's talk about the drugs. Today I learned for the first time, honestly, that the entire thing is about this valuable real estate on Josephine Street. Telly Hankton wants to control that. So now he is killing people and he is doing everything so that this open air market that he ran, according to the government, can continue to prosper, can continue to produce the wealth of Telly Hankton. Let's talk about it. I told you when I stepped up here the first day we met, and I hope I have kept my word to you, I told you he is not a saint. I did, and I'm going to say it again. He is not a saint. He sold drugs, he sold drugs, and for that he is going to jail. He has been in jail, and like all the other witnesses that were not police officers, for the most part, with very few exceptions, who got up on that stand, the ugly reality, it's an ugly reality, and he was there. But Josephine Street, let's talk about what you heard in terms of evidence. You heard Agent Burris, the FBI agent, 
who told you starting in 2000, there was this joint task force, the FBI, the DEA, the ATF, the NOPD, gang enforcement, violent drugs. We know there's an open air market on Josephine Street and we are going to shut it down. We know this. So what do they do? They start by doing surveillance. They start paying attention. Who are the players? They start arresting people. When I ask Agent Burris, did you once arrest this man? What he told you? No. When you went in the house, 2011 Josephine Street, let's be real clear whose house that was. The Stewart's. It's called the Stewart House. They searched that house. Telly Hankton and his mother lived in 1920 Josephine Street, down the block. When they searched that Stewart House, was Telly Hankton there? No. No, he wasn't there. Then they say, we'll set up controlled buys. We got confidential informants to wear wires and go in and make drug purchases so we can prove what's going on on Josephine Street. And they did. Numerous buys. I had Agent Burris talk about them. Not once was any of them with Telly Hankton. Not one. I said, okay, let's talk about it, Agent Burris. You have video cameras watching. You say you know his comings and his goings. Do you have video of that? No, we don't. Sorry, we don't have it. Okay, you have sat through this trial, ladies and gentlemen. With all the big drug dealing going on, not one item of drugs put in the hand of Telly Hankton. You have heard him talking about, excuse me, I've got to take a little sip. You heard him talk about big, big drug dealing, and he brought up Adrian Mosley. Adrian Mosley out of Texas. He came in here. I think he was really honest, and what he said about his drug dealings with Telly didn't really get a whole lot. He bought four to six kilos a month during a four to five month period out of the year. For him, the big drug dealer out of Texas, Telly was a small fry. You heard Mr. Quinley say Telly and Dylan, and they showed a picture of Mr. Dylan. But when Adrian Mosley was asked, did you see Telly Hankton get, was third, was the question, actually, how they referred to Telly. Getting a portion of the loads that Sam was getting from you? He says, I never saw that happen. That's his story. He talked about Telly Hankton. He said Telly was a man of his word, a man of his word. You heard other people get up and talk about Telly. That wasn't really like Telly. Telly was cool. Telly was calm. That's the character that you heard of this man from people who are on the stand. You heard Aaron Smith, who they keep referring to as the person, and I'm skipping. I hope y'all can keep up because I'm telling this story and trying to understand it and weave it because it's complicated. It's a complicated story. But I want to go to Aaron Smith for a minute because I keep hearing the date 6 9 That's the date he went to jail. That's the date he introduced Telly to Walter Porter. But you also heard Aaron Smith talking. He sat up on that stand and he said, Telly was like my big brother. Telly would greet me with a smile. Telly would give me good advice. Telly would embrace me and tell me how to stay out of trouble. He would give me money. When I tried to talk to Telly about hooking up Walter Porter, Telly said, man, leave that alone. You heard that from Aaron, leave it alone. Aaron Smith gives two different versions of how Telly and Walter hook up. One version was he and Telly were together. Walter comes along. Walter gets in the car, they go to Walter's house, and there's a resume. Walter applies for the job, and he shows all of his wares, his guns, his bulletproof vest, and all this stuff to take on this job. That's one version. In the same testimony, he tells you, Walter called me, excited, because he finally met Telly. He didn't say, I put them together. He said, Walter said, I finally met Telly. Two different versions. But the one thing he consistently said was Telly, when Telly met Walter, he said, man, that boy crazy. That was his response, that boy crazy. Not, ooh, I can't wait to get with him and hire him to do a business with me. He said, leave it alone, Aaron. That's what he told him, leave it alone. So we talked about this overwhelming evidence of wanting to control valuable real estate. Adrian Mosley got on the stand and talked about his wealth, his five acres of land, his Mercedes Benz, how much money they were actually caught with when they were arrested, the guns they were arrested with. Ask yourself, the government says Telly Hankton sold over $43 million of drugs. That's what they told you. It's in the indictment. But yet, did they come in here and show you any wealth? Did they parade houses, a house, cars, a car, jewelry, any kind, money in the bank, money under the house, 
money in the strong box? Did they do anything to show you that this man is an enterprise? He's an enterprise. That's the word, enterprise. The Hankton Enterprise. The Hankton Organization. You know what was interesting about the Hankton Organization? You heard from Alvin Neal. Now I'm not going to pretend I remember his educational level or anything else. But one thing I remember when he testified very early on, his thing was, you know, I purchased drugs from the Hankton Organization. Who talks like that? Who? When we go around talking, we don't say, oh, I went to buy Coca-Cola from the Coca-Cola LTD. That's not how we talk. But if you are reading the Dagon indictment and the charge is Hankton Organization, then that sounds like how you are supposed to say it. But when pressed to say, what is the Hankton Organization? Break it down for me. Do you know what he said? I hope you remember. Thomas Hankton, not Telly. But that was the Hankton organization. That's the language that was used. When we talk about protecting real estate and the feud, you heard several witnesses. Now Latoya Stewart, who testified she truly believed that Telly Hankton killed her brother. And so she gave you a lot of little kernels about Telly was this and Telly was involved in that. But then she kind of helped him because she told you several things. When Telly supposedly sold drugs to them, they paid him. It was an organization here. I'm going to distribute this and then later come back and get my money. No, when you bought drugs, you paid for your drugs and everybody went on about their business. The feud wasn't about you selling heroin and I'm going to, you are going to make more money than so-and-so make selling cocaine. Telly was never out on the street selling nothing. The thing was his aunts. Two of them lived on Josephine Street and he said, Guys, do your business somewhere else. Don't sit on my people's steps selling heroin. Don't do that. It's wrong. Don't do that. That's what it was about. You heard several people tell you that. Several of them came in here and said it was about him telling Pluck, man, don't sit there and sell heroin on my aunt's steps. Don't do it. It's wrong. That's what happened. Then they, you heard the witnesses tell you, they went and said, we're going to take him out. The nerve of him going to try to tell us how to do our business. We're going to take him out. That's what you heard, not the other way around. But the government would have you to believe valuable real estate on Josephine is the catalyst for this case, and it's not. So let's go back to Cup. Once Darnell Stewart is killed and Telly Hankton's name surfaced, Telly Hankton was able to post a million dollar bond. The government introduced that bond paper. I want you to pay close attention to it because it sounds, ooh, he must have had a million dollars. He posted a million dollar bond. What you will see on that bond paper is several pieces of property. People came together, family and friends, who believed in this young man and said, we will help get you out. We will help you. In hindsight, I'm sure he wished he would have stayed in jail because then he wouldn't have had all these other problems. But his family got him out of jail on a million dollar bond. At some point, you heard them say he was going to be rearrested because he failed to show up. But I hope you remember, when I asked the officer, was he revoked? The judge didn't revoke him. He said, you didn't properly serve him, let him go. So he wasn't revoked. But then here we come with Jesse Reed in that murder. That is where the mystery really starts because Desmond Pratt was the lead investigator in the Jesse Reed homicide. You remember Desmond Pratt. He was paraded like so many others in this case, in his orange jumpsuit, in his chain, and he said, I'm not talking, I'm going to take the fifth. But he was asked several questions that he took the fifth on, including, did you frame Telly Hankton? Did you do it? He didn't answer. But Keith Burris testified and told you that Desmond Pratt is being investigated by the Civil Rights Division of this government, of the Department of Justice. He is being investigated for his actions. So let's examine them for a minute. Let's examine them. He responds to the scene of Jesse Reed's murder. And when he gets there, Hassan Williams is on the scene. Now we don't have language, unfortunately, because Desmond Pratt is not talking and Hassan Williams is dead. But what we do know is they were on the scene together. What we do know is that they had a prior relationship. You heard people talk about flag football and midnight basketball. They were on the team. Desmond is the coach. Hassan is a player. Jesse Reed was also involved in that. So what we know without a doubt is that Pratt had the ability to say to Hassan, this is how we are going to play this. This is what I want you to say. He had the ability to do that. Let me see those pictures. Hassan, you heard his statements. 
I want them to see Skinny and Telly. Hassan says, I know Telly Hankton, and I know he was the shooter. I know that. He says that after he had an opportunity to talk to Pratt. Then Pratt instructs him someone to take him to the 6th District Station, not to Homicide Headquarters, but to the 6th District Station. Then you heard from Detective Burns, Sergeant Burns. He supposedly was instructed to go get him from the 6th District and take him to the headquarters. The interesting thing about his testimony, and of course, we are talking, what, seven years ago? But his memory failed him a little bit because what he said was, me and Dylan, Melanie Dylan, went together, drove him together. He was crying and very distraught, and we, he was trying to talk, but we didn't take notes. I'm driving and she is trying to control him, etc. But when Burns talked and she testified first, she said, I was told to go to headquarters and meet Burns, who was with the witness. So her testimony wasn't, I was at the 6th district, I rode in the car, I watched him cry and tell the story, but I went to the headquarters and met them and took a statement. It's a slight variation, but when we are talking about somebody's life, all the slight variations matter. They matter. Because what's really important about Hassan is when Hassan gives a statement and he says Telly Hankton at some point, it's not in his grand jury testimony, but there was a testimony that he also indicated Skinny. You have heard Edward Skinny Allen. I think, again, it was Burris who talked about he was initially implicated in the murder. He was ultimately released after two years because the FBI realized he was telling the truth when he said, I'm in Texas and I can prove it. I'm somewhere else. So we take Skinny's picture away and we put Porter in his place. I think we should also put Desmond Pratt's picture in here too. Because what happens with Desmond Pratt, I'm not going to pretend I'm smart enough to explain why. But what he does is he says, Hassan is not enough. Hassan is not enough. We need more people to say, tell this story the way I want you to tell it. So he comes up with two other witnesses, Donald Reed and Tyrone Calloway. Now you didn't hear from Tyrone Calloway, but you did hear from Donald Reed. Donald Reed told you specifically, it was months before he ever came forward, but when he did, it was because Desmond Pratt came to him and said, this is what I need you to do for me. I need you to say you were on the scene. I need you to say it was Telly Hankton and Walter Porter. I need you to say you witnessed it. Here is a picture. Study the picture. I'm going to destroy it. Then I'm going to help you out. I'm going to do some things for you. Donald Reed said, I was scared. To be honest, I was scared. Why was he scared of Desmond Pratt? He was scared of Desmond Pratt because he knew things about Desmond Pratt long before Jesse Tutu Reed was killed. He knew Desmond Pratt would put drugs on people. He knew Desmond Pratt would pick people up in one area of town and take them to what he called enemy territory and drop them off so they could be beat up. He knew Desmond Pratt himself and other police officers would beat you up. He knew Desmond Pratt was having sex with some woman for money and giving her weed. He knew a lot about Desmond Pratt and he knew he didn't play by the rules. And so when you say to me, this is what I need you to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And he did, he did. He told it to the police. He told it to the state prosecutors. He told it to the grand jury, the state grand jury. It wasn't until the FBI and the United States attorneys started interviewing him and realized this is not fitting. Something is wrong. And he learned Desmond Pratt is in jail. He could sigh a relief. He could get rid of his fear and he could tell the truth. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I didn't see anything, including Telly Hankton kill Tutu. I didn't see it. I said it because Desmond Pratt told me to say it. Now you've got a lot of evidence saying there's so many people who can talk about what happened the night Jesse Reed was killed. And those so many people they put on this witness stand all say specifically, I really don't know Telly Hankton. If I know him, I only know him because I know him from the streets. I might have seen him but I have no relationship with them. Nobody says Telly Hankton said, I was there. Nobody said any of the guns that connect all the different murders, and we will talk about that in a minute, had anything to do with Telly Hankton. Of all the evidence that was laid out on this floor, of gun and bullets, none of them connect to Telly Hankton. Agent Burris was asked when he said specifically, when I asked him of all the evidence, physical, tangible evidence against Telly Hankton in this case, what do you have? He said nothing. He said, we have no physical tangible evidence against Telly Hankton in this case. Not a gun, not a bullet, not a photograph, 
Not a confession, not a statement out of his mouth. Nothing. That's what he had. But what we have is people pointing the finger at Walter Porter. I told you when we first started this case, the reason why Walter Porter is sitting at this table with Telly Hankton is because that's the overwhelming evidence that they want us to use against Telly Hankton by pointing the finger at Walter Porter. Walter Porter's people who testified said they are from the 13th Ward. There's a certain way that people in the 13th Ward do things. They told you they didn't mind killing. It was a trophy. They told you drugs is money. Money is power. Power is respect. 13th Ward. That's how they were running things. They told you that Walter Porter liked to talk. So then you start thinking, well, let's see if what they say is consistent with the evidence or the street legend. So let's talk about some of those witnesses. Some of the witnesses say Walter Porter said he did it. He did it himself. He doesn't name other people when he is bragging. Other witnesses says he did it with Telly and Telly's cousin. Some say they both jumped out of the car and the cousin stayed in the car. Others say, oh no, the cousin jumped out too because he was doing crowd control. Some say there was no crowd. Some say there was a crowd. There's a whole lot of ways the story goes. But if we take some of the evidence, some of the statements and not others, then are we truly saying the government has proved the case beyond a reasonable doubt when we talk about Telly Hankton? One thing I have asked you all, early on we talked about credibility and how you judge it. One, we look to see if there's a motive to lie. And then we look to see if the statements actually match what happened. So we have witnesses whose statements do not match what happened. They bring up this video. Walter Porter is in the video with his 13th Ward friends, BG and Fetty, and whoever else they named. And most of them say, I don't know Telly Hankton. But they talk about Walter Porter signing his own indictment by saying Mooney, BG saying Mooney shot him 50 times. That's the whole thing, him. Not Tutu, not anybody in particular, him. But what they tell you is supposedly Mooney is known for firing off two guns with lots of ammo. So that language in the video could be referring to a whole lot of stuff. A whole lot of stuff. We don't know. We move from what happened to Jesse Tutu Reed, and now Telly Hankton is back in jail. Hassan Williams gets killed. The statement is Telly Hankton apparently sends Walter Porter because he was a witness. Telly Hankton is not charged in that murder. You saw the chart that Mr. Quinlan showed you. But even the way that story is told about how it happened is inconsistent with the evidence of how it happened. One thing we know is that Hassan Williams was killed clutching drugs. We know he was in the drug gang. One thing we know is that when it was called in, 950, you heard the detective chambers tell you he got the call at 950. You heard him tell you, I then got a call from Detective Pratt before he got to the scene. He said, I think one of my witnesses in the Jesse Reed murder has just been killed. Chambers told you he was on the scene at 10.02. So between 9.50 and 10.02, Detective Pratt, that guy, he knows what's going on. He knows what's going on. How he knows, we don't know. Because Detective Chambers also told you that family members did not come and identify Hassan Williams until 11 o'clock. So that means an hour before the family identified the body, Detective Pratt is on the phone saying, my witness is dead. Hmm, but he took the fifth. Let's talk about John Matthews. John Matthews, in addition to saying, I'm not certain, he looks similar, but I'm not certain. He is willing to come forward and tell the truth about what he saw and let the chips fall where it may. He said that, and he paid. I definitely agree with the government when he said he paid the ultimate price. Not only did he get shot, not only is he still suffering, he lost his brother and he lost his business. But one thing he said about Telly Hankton was, I saw the guy who shot Darnell Stewart and when I looked at Telly Hankton in court, I said, the guy who was in front of my shop, in front of my daiquiri shop, was almost as dark as me, not his color. He told you that, not his color. Even though he said, he looks similar, can't be certain, maybe 95, 98. One thing he told you recently, he wasn't his color. That's important. That's important, ladies and gentlemen. What else is important is he said he identified Thomas Hankton as a shooter. He said, I think there were two, but I only saw one. And he said it was Thomas. Let's talk about some of these witnesses because some of the witnesses say that either Walter Porter told them or they in fact went with him. Joe Miller testified and told you, I went with Walter to go kill this guy in the East. Another witness told you, when Walter got there, he had to go up the stairs. You saw the pictures of Mr. Matthews' home. There are no stairs. So when we talk about facts, Sometimes the facts get blurred if you really don't know them. 
If you are trying to get favor from the witness, stand by telling what you think you know. Now Mr. Quinlan embraced Michael Anderson. I hope y'all remember him because he embraced him. He said, that's the proof. Michael Anderson said, Telly Hankton said, go with the W, go with the W, that's the proof. He had contraband phones in jail and he was able to make a call. But again, it's about credibility because fortunately, the government turned over his letters that he wrote, that he is saying, put me on the stand. I could be the star witness. I got this. I know what's going on. Then he meets his wifey in jail, a woman he has never seen face to face, but he writes to her and tells her, here, this is what I need you to say. Say you met Telly in late 08, early 09, because he was in Texas. Say you got plenty cocaine, kilos of cocaine from Telly in Texas. Don't tell them you know me. That would be a problem. But here is a picture of Telly and here is his paperwork. So now you know what's going on. That's what you heard by Michael Anderson. That's the witness they are relying on. The one that says, let's set up Teddy so I can come home. How many of the other witnesses got up there and testified for favor? Each of them told you, I'm trying to get, we talked about it, you probably know it by now, a rule of 35. That's a reduction. Everybody wants one. Everybody tells the story that they think the government needs to do their job to convict the people they charge so I can go home. Forget the truth. Forget who it hurts. I want to come home. It is your job, ladies and gentlemen, to determine their credibility. Is it real? Or is it I know, I have read the newspaper, I heard it on the news, I talked to other people. You heard one guy say, how would I know? I'm three hours away. He told you that. He is in Pollock. In the same breath, he said, when I was in Angola, I talked to my people when they told me. This is a game that is played. It's an ugly game. But when inmates go to jail, they trade knowledge. They trade information. You heard one guy say, I need a fake transcript, sentencing transcript. Get the government to send me a fake transcript because if these guys get a hold of what I say, they're gonna use it. And everybody knows to keep your papers to your chest. Keep them to your chest because if anybody knows anything, they're going to say, oh, I saw it, I saw it. Let's talk about, I only have 10 minutes. You have seven minutes. Seven minutes? Oh, quick, quick. Where do I go in seven minutes? There's a lot to be said, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot to be said about the witnesses and the lack of credibility, but I want to re-urge this overwhelming evidence against Telly Hankton. I want you to say, show me one gun, show me one picture, Show me something that says overwhelming evidence because I don't see it. I didn't see it. I've looked for it. I've asked for it. I've questioned every witness up there to try and say, let's put this together. I really wish, you know, this is really true. On behalf of Telly, I wish I could tell you. Judge, some of the defendants are saying I can have a little more of their time. No, I said if you don't take your full time, someone else could have your time. But I'm first. Everybody agreed to one hour. That's what you get. You have now six minutes. Okay. In those six minutes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to thank you again. I'm going to trust you on behalf of Telly Hankton. I'm going to look at each and every one of you in your eyes and say, I know you listened. I know you paid attention. I know you have questions. I know there's doubt. There's doubt. We wish we could prove this case to you and tell you this is who did it. This is why they did it. It wasn't Telly. He had an alibi. All those things, I wish I could. That would make it nice and clean. It's not clean. It's not clean. It's not pretty. But what it is, it is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Telly Hankton killed anybody. That's what we don't have. It is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt that there's this Hankton organization enterprise that's making $43 million. There's nothing there. Every person that sells drugs deserves to go to jail. Every one of them. But every person that sells drugs is not an enterprise. That's what he is not. I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that I have at least made you question so that when you go in the back and you start deliberating, you say, wait a minute, there's some points there. We are not going to just let it be a broad brush. We are not going to say, must have been Telly Hankton. We are going to say, prove it to me beyond a reasonable doubt. And when they haven't done that, and they haven't done that, I'll trust you will come back with a verdict of not guilty. Thank you.